The analysis of electric fields from various charge distributions will occupy a considerable amount of our time here. There is a variety of geometries that are of concern, so we will go through the details in their analysis. One of them is the dipole. Dipole configurations come up frequently in nature, such as water molecules. So let's see how we might analyze a dipole. So we have two charges, plus and minus. In a dipole, you have equal and opposite charges. So they're spread apart by 10 centimeters. And each of these charges of 12 nanocoulombs are 13 centimeters from point P here. And we're going to figure out the electric field at point P. This is pretty simple because we just have two charges that are producing electric fields. And we do the vector sum. Basic concept. Well, there's the force, and force and charge, I'm sorry, force and electric field are related as force per charge is electric field. So when you divide by Q, one of these Qs goes away. You have KQ over R squared from a point charge. So the first one, the 12 nanocoulomb charge, out here at point P, since the electric field is pointing away from the charge, this is the vector representing that electric field, and this angle theta is also here. Likewise, the negative 12 nanocoulomb charge has the same size of electric field, but it's going toward the negative charge. When you consider those together, they add up to give the vector sum. So there it is, E1 plus E2. Now, E1 is equal to E2 in magnitude. Same distance from the same magnitude of charge. And that is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q over R squared. That's 9 times 10 to the 9th. Q, which is 12 nanocoulombs, over 0.13 squared. 6.39 times 10 to the 3rd. So there is the size of the electric field from each of the point charges. Now we need the horizontal component and so let's go ahead and do that. In the x direction both again of the charges produce the same magnitude and from symmetry considerations we see that the electric field and the x from each are the same and it's E1 or E2 cosine of the angle. So the size of this electric field, cosine of the angle, gives us the horizontal component from each one. Now, what is the cosine of theta? Well, if we look down here at the geometry of the whole thing, if we run a line right down like this, split this in half to get a right triangle, then the cosine is adjacent, which is 5 centimeters, over hypotenuse, 13 centimeters. So 6390 times 5 thirteenths, which is 2460. So there's the magnitudes. And now since we know the sum of the E fields in the Y direction is zero because of symmetry, we get our answer. 4900 newtons per coulomb. Let's now pick up the analysis of a finite line of charge. So here's our charge line and its extent from the x-axis is between plus and minus a. So it's 2a in length. Total charge is q and we're going to figure out the electric field at point p. Well we start with a differential q here, dq, and it's across length dy. So we have dy dq depending on how you want to look at that. Both differential concepts there. So we extend a line down here. This is the length from that differential charge, which is then a point charge. And we know what the point charge acts like. And it's going to have a contribution to the electric field here at point P. Of course, there's an innumerable number of differential charges that are all going to contribute to the electric field at P along here. Sounds like an integration problem. Well, it is. This is the differential electric field 
from that differential charge at angle theta, as you can see. Now, it's also got the horizontal component, which is what we're going to be interested in. You probably see, based on how we set this up, that there's symmetry associated with this that's going to help us. So we have differential electric field in the Y also. Now, R, the distance separating the charge from the point, is just the hypotenuse of the line, so square root of x squared plus y squared. Now we define what we call linear charge density. This is an important concept that will reoccur and transform into different aspects, different physical quantities as well, with surface charge density and other things. So first, linear charge density is just lambda and its charge per length. So the charge density is how much charge there is per length. So what's the charge? Q. What's the length? 2A. So the total charge over the total length is the linear charge density. Hopefully that makes sense. And now dq, differential charge, related to that is lambda dy. Now why can I say that? Lambda is the charge per length. Charge over length times differential length is differential charge. Now if that didn't make sense, let me express it this way. If you look at q over 2a, if we multiply both sides of this thing by 2a, the total charge is the charge per length times the 2a, which is the total length. So total charge is linear charge density times total length. Differential charge is linear charge density times differential length. All right, let's now use this to help us. And the reason this is going to help us is because we don't want dq in our integral. We're going to want dy because we can actually do something when we integrate dy. Namely, do the integral across the extent of this finite length, which is in the y direction. We can't do it with respect to dq. So lambda, we just defined as q over 2a, so dq is q over 2a dy. So we've just transformed dq into dy. So that's going to be very useful to us. So differential electric field is k, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, dq over r squared from that differential q, which is, I'll call 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 k, the proportionality constant. So dq over r squared, square root of x squared plus y squared, squared. And this then becomes dq, q over 2a. So there's q over 2a. Square root of x squared plus y squared, squared. Just removes the square root times dy. So de and the x. Okay, now that we have de, differential e, Differential e in the x direction, the horizontal component, is just that value times the cosine of theta. So the cosine of theta is also this, adjacent over hypotenuse. That's going to be x over r, and r is this. So let's continue on. All right, so here again is a picture of the geometry of the situation, and we have differential electric field in the x direction, dE cosine of theta. So we just computed the differential E, which is this, and we're going to multiply it by the cosine of theta, which is x over square root of x squared plus y squared. Now you see the x squared plus y squared to the first power multiplied by x squared plus y squared to the one half power. So when we bring them together, and that's cosine of theta. We get q over 4 pi epsilon 0, x dy over 2a, x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. So that's our differential electric field in the x direction. Now let's consider the same thing in the y direction. Well, the difference is we're going to have sine instead of cosine. This is cosine of the magnitude and now we have the sine. So that's going to be very similar in form. 
In fact, the differential E, the magnitude, is the same as what we have here. Okay, so I'm going to combine all this together, not this part, here. So that's the same thing that we had before. But this time, we're going to multiply it by sine of theta, which is y over square root of x squared plus y squared. So that's minus q over 4 pi epsilon 0, y dy over 2a x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. So the only difference between these, we have an x here, we have a y here, and everything else is the same. So now let's look to see what the e field in the x direction is. So we have the differential e in the x, so let's integrate now. We bring out the constants, so these are the constants. And there's the integral from mi minus a to a dy over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. Now the reason I can bring this x out is because x is a constant. As we integrate across this line of charge, the x value is the same throughout that whole process. So the, the differential is y, not x. Now from tables, we can see that this form, this expression, now notice that I have dx here, and there's dy here, so we're transposing y and x. So here the a is, is a constant, but over here, x is the constant, where here, x is the variable. So hopefully that's not too confusing, but this form has this result, 1 over the constant squared, variable over square root of x squared plus a squared, variable squared plus constant squared. So we're going to use that and express this given that new understanding, which by the way, you don't need to come up with on your own. This analysis is fairly intricate, as you can tell already, and uh, there's benefit in going through the exercise, but you won't have to memorize this. So, e in the x, we take out the constants, the 2 and the 4 become an 8, so here's the constant. And this is the result of the integral, this whole part here, 1 over x squared, y over square root of x squared plus y squared. We're in integrating from negative a to a. Keep in mind that even though this is e in the x direction, the differential is y, so this is the variable that's changing. So one of the x's goes away, and we have q over 8 pi epsilon 0 ax. And we put in a for this part here and subtract off negative a. So that's added. So that's two of these, making the 8 become a 4. a's go away, and we get this result relatively simple, not too complex there. Let's do the same thing now for y. So e and the y, same form, but we have negative q over 4 pi epsilon 0 times 2a. We could call that 8. And here's the integral, negative a to a of y dy over x squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. Now in a similar way, if we look at what that integral form takes, it looks like this. It's a different form than the one in the x direction. We have the y dy over y squared plus x squared to the 3 halves. So this is a different form. So when we apply this form to the result that we have here, we get ey, bring out the constants, times 1 over square root of y squared plus x squared. Again, this is ey, but now the differential is y, so we'll stick in a for the y and we get the following. This result, a squared plus x squared, and then we're gonna subtract, and we get minus one over square root of a squared plus x squared. And you can see what that is, it's zero. And that is from, a con from an, in an intuitive way, you can see from symmetry that it should be zero because every dq on the original diagram has a counter dq on the other side that uniquely cancels out the y components of the electric field. 
So in summary then, we have the electric field is only in the x direction. So we don't even have to express it that way right now. 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Q over x squared of x squared plus a squared in the direction i. So this is general. Fortunately, you don't have to memorize this formula. But that analysis gave us the result for a finite line of charge, the electric field at some point p. Keeping in mind that the point p was actually symmetrically placed right in the middle at some distance away from that line of charge. Now what happens if x is much greater than a? So if x is really big, the distance to the point p compared to the length of charge. If you think about seeing a finite length of charge and walking a long, 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 long ways away and looking back and observing it, what does it appear like? That's right, it starts looking like a point charge. Well, this will become negligible with respect to this. So the whole thing reduces to q over 4 pi epsilon 0 x squared, which in fact is the formula for a point charge. So that is in fact what it becomes as x gets very large. Well, that was perhaps a little bit grueling, so if you want to take a two-minute break, go ahead and do so, and we'll come back and finish up with a consideration of an infinite line of charge. So the infinite line of charge would seem to be maybe a lot more difficult. But what we're going to see is that, in fact, it's not. So an infinite line of charge just has that A extending to infinity in both directions. So what's the electric field at point P? Well, from symmetry considerations, we still have the Y components canceling, so it's all in the X direction. So we know it's going to look like this, but how big is it? Is it infinitely big? Because we have no end to the amount of contributions from dqs way a long ways away in the x direction. So how's that going to look? Well, now lambda is q over 2a. But of course, a is a very large number, isn't it? Actually, without limit. But in any case, in this expression, q is 2a lambda. Now, if a goes to infinity, of course, the charge goes to infinity. And infinities are not happy entities when we're trying to calculate physical quantities. Well, putting that aside for a moment, considering our result, our general result here, let's go ahead and express it. 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, 2a lambda, that's q, 2a lambda, over the same result here. Of course, a going to infinity is a problem. But then notice that a is down here as well, under the radicand, and it's a squared. So two quantities going to infinity that are fighting each other, not a happy mathematical situation. And in any case, you know that I really dislike having the same physical quantity showing up twice in an expression like this. So let's get rid of the 2 and make it 1. So to do that, we'll divide by 1 over a over 1 over a. And then we get the 2 and the 4 give us 2 here. And it'll be lambda over, since this 1 over a takes care of that a, and then 1 over a in the denominator. We have to square it when we get inside the, the radicand. And a squared under x and a squared over a squared is 1. So, aha, now we just see a by itself, only one place. Now, we let a go to infinity while the linear charge density doesn't change. And then x squared over a squared, as a goes to infinity, goes towards 0. That's a very happy thing. So, this whole deal here is 0. And we get the electric field, specifically lambda over 2 pi epsilon 0 x in the i direction. So that is the expression of the electric field for an infinite line of charge. Now this one is worth having some recollection of. In other words, you want to 
try and start committing that to memory. And it shows up relatively frequently because even in your computer system, you have at a micro level, little lines of charge in various places that from the perspective of the macro scale of the, of the electronic components and the very small dimensions of points away from those lines of charges, the various uh, charge lines look like essentially infinite lines. So in any case, this is something that is not too rare in practical reality.